Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me back there? I can hardly see you. Welcome to Glastonbury Abbey. I am Father Timothy, monk of the monastery, and a member also of the Glastonbury Institute. Oh, I needed that. Use that one too. Okay. Is it on? Good. Well, this one's on, but, but this one's recording, I think. Okay. We a special welcome tonight to the uh, members of the Harvard Conference on Urbanism, Spirituality, and Well-Being. I haven't gotten to know many of the people, but the other monks are talking about that they have come from England and Australia and all over the world for this conference. Uh, notable uh, happening here for us little monks here in this little community. We welcome uh, Professor Harvey, Harvey Cox, the Hollis Research Professor of Divinity at Harvard, who has for some years now been writing, speaking, and uh, stimulating us on the interaction of religion, culture, and politics. We welcome Harvey as a friend of the monastery. He has come here often to be with us, to spend some time, and we always welcome his presence. Uh, he has spoken already in our interfaith lecture series, listening to other voices. So we, we feel he is a friend, and we enjoy his presence very much. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the secular city, 1965, and the turmoil that went through. Uh, uh, I was ordained just a couple of, couple of years, and all of this change was in the air, and was looking at things differently. And uh, the Second Vatican Council for us Catholics, uh, very important. And uh, here's Harvey Cox with the Secular City. Since then, he has been uh, not stuck in any one way, but I feel his, his writings have reflected uh, different positions, uh, different aspects. I loved his Future of Faith, which was in 2009. I remember reading that well and making me rethink where we are, what does it mean to believe now, and so forth. I think he has a lot to offer. For a Catholic, uh, Javi Cox, who professes to be a Baptist minister, you still are. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. He, he is such an ecumenical soul, and, you know, and he, he uh, is open to what's happening in all areas. Uh, he, I heard him quoted as saying that the election of Pope Francis is a quantum leap for the church. I sure hope so. <laughs> Yesterday he had a blog on the National Catholic Reporter on Andrew Greeley, Father Andrew Greeley, who died this past week and was buried yesterday. And uh, Harvey Cox called him a fellow contrarian. <laughs> so he, he's got great views, great, great, great insights, and we're really glad such good audience came out to hear the talk, which he has just renamed for me, The Monastery, The City, and Especially the Road in Between. Professor Harvey Cox. <laughs> Thank you, Father Timothy, really. Anybody who started with the secular city and ended with the blog that came out yesterday is really been <laughs> following me pretty closely. That makes me a bit apprehensive, but uh, it's a great, great joy to be back here. And one of the joys is to be able to give a little bit. Am I supposed to be holding this? No, you should be speaking, speaking into that. that. Yeah. yeah okay. <clears throat> one of the great joys of being here is to be able to give a little back to Glastonbury Abbey, where I have been a number of times on personal retreat and experience the wonderful renewal and revivification that uh, it happens here. Many, many of you, of course, have had that experience, and I'm so grateful for it. And this is a chance for me a little bit to say thank you. I also wanted to tell you a little bit about what this lecture is part of. We have a large group of people meeting here, uh, part of a very long and somewhat ambitious project to bring together, at long last, architects, city planners, public health officials, theologians, philosophers, builders, engineers, who all have something to do with an immense task that lies before all of us. 
which is the following. <clears throat> Within the next 20 to 25 years, we human beings have to build around the world as many cities as already now exist. The growth in population, especially the growth in population in urban areas is going to make that necessary. And frankly, if you look at the cities we've built in the last 25 years or 50 years and what we've done to the ones that we have, the news is not particularly good. And everybody here, and there are some very thoughtful uh, people here, uh, architects, city planners, designers, all rather agree that th this is not something on which we as human beings have done a very good job. We have to do better. And one of the reasons we haven't done such a good job, we believe, is that we haven't been talking to each other enough. The theologians live in one silo, the public health people live in another silo, the architects live in another silo, and we hardly ever meet each other. So now we've decided enough of that. We've really got to have a new and constructive conversation because of this enormous responsibility we have as human beings uh, in, our, in the ensuing decades. <clears throat> so we're starting that conversation now. And it's going wonderfully well so far. I hope after this evening it's still going just as well. <laughs> we'll see. And I have a particular responsibility tonight, which I'll get around to in a moment. I want to say also uh, just a word or two about myself, uh, why I have any qualification, whatever, to be part of this conversation. Uh, it's almost universally agreed now by the people who design, think about, build cities, that spirituality is an absolutely essential dimension in human community. That didn't used to be the case. 30, 40, 50 years ago, people were talking about the disappearance, the marginalization of religion, all of that. Now there seems to be a consensus that this is a component of human existence which simply has to be included, and it has to be included not just in our minds and in our, uh, but in the way we design our cities, how we live together, how we meet each other, the spaces we have to meet each other, the places where we can encounter God's nature even some goats. <laughs> I visited the goats today. <clears throat> uh, we'd like to have a few goats on, in Harvard Yard, if you could rent us uh, uh, some. We've tried a cow. That worked out pretty well. Now I think the next step is some, some goats. Uh, but seriously, uh, here we are. And we're at a critical moment now in, the, uh, urban, in urban history. And I speak this evening, especially I, I teach at Harvard Divinity School, I also teach in the uh, World Religions uh, program at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Harvard College. And I'm, I have been for a number of years one of the faculty members associated with something called the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard, where we bring together scholar practitioners of the various world religions. They live together, they eat together, they talk, they worship together, they visit our classes, they get to know each other, and I've gotten to know a lot of them. So part of the input that you'll be hearing this evening is what I've gleaned over the years, uh, especially recent years, from some of these wonderful colleagues, Buddhists, Muslims, Jews, Shintoists, all the rest, who gather there in Cambridge and, uh, and make our lives richer. So that's the project. Future cities, and what are we going to do about them? Now, uh, the road in between <laughs> the monastery and the city uh, is, uh, let me use the Spanish term, it's the Camino, the Camino. And Father just told me that he has been on the Camino, the, the traditional Camino. How many of you have walked the Camino to Capistela? Some of you have. Uh, I want to come back in a few moments to talk about the surprising and unanticipated resurgence in our so-called secular time of this enormous interest in pilgrimage, in visiting whole old holy sites, uh, old religious sites. It's coming back with an enormous uh, uh, bang, if you will. Lots and lots and lots of people are doing it. And I think it's an indication of something that's happening in our whole culture which takes us beyond the definition of ourselves as secular people into what I like to call, might be a good book title, 
the post-secular city. You like that? <laughs> what is it that's, what is, what is the new spirituality that's emerging in our time, that the configuration of the way in which spirituality is expressing itself, uh, which had been uh, unanticipated, unexpected. We'll talk, talk about that in just a moment. Pilgrimage, uh, I think, is a very, the resurgence, I'll call it, the resurgence of pilgrimage, pilgrimages all over the world in various cr uh, religious traditions, not just Christian traditions, all over the world, is for me both a sign, an indication of this new spirituality which is dawning in the 21st century, which is both in part in continuity with existing old traditional spiritualities of which we're familiar, but also with new elements brought in, reconfigured, recombined, so that we have something uh, that hasn't ever quite existed before in the world of spirituality. Uh, we're coming to that in just a moment. It's a sign of that. It's also an embodiment of this new spirituality. And uh, it's a, uh, uh, I think it's a hopeful and welcome sign. <clears throat> so th that's the kind of outline of what I want to say this evening. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about the pilgrimage as such. To use a fancy term, let me say the phenomenology of pilgrimage. What are the main features of pilgrimage? What attracts people to them? Uh, what is it about them that speaks to us in our confused, not quite religious, not quite secular, uh, kind of wandering, searching stage that we seem to be in all of us nowadays? And then I want to talk about the implications of this new spiritual constellation that's emerging in our time for the way we plan and build all these future cities. Now, I'm treading on very difficult territory here. I'm talking to a whole lot of people who actually, who actually do this. So I wanted them to know, before I start, I'll set out the uh, picture I can of the emerging spirituality. You plan the cities. <laughs> you build them. Uh, to respond to and, and nurture this wonderful new, uh, unanticipated emerging spirituality. So that's where we're going this evening. So here's how we start. Let's start with uh, a wonderful pilgrimage site, which has uh, quite recently come to the fore again after not having been uh, used for quite a while. It's called Glastonbury Abbey. <laughs> not this Glastonbury Abbey, although you could say the same thing about this one. I'm talking about the original Glastonbury Abbey in Somerset in England. You've been there, I'm sure, uh, which was built way back in the 7th century, I think, to begin with. Uh, taken over eventually by the Normans when they came in. And then uh, I, I read up on the history of this. I don't, it's not what I learned at Harvard Divinity School. I had to look elsewhere for this. Uh, then somebody discovered what they thought was the tomb of King Arthur at Glastonbury Abbey. And uh, so I visited Glastonbury, the other one, uh, last year, and visited that grave, Hic Yachet Sepultus, Includus Rex Arthurus in Sua Avalona. Now, for those of you who are down in your Latin a little bit, that means here there lies the body of King Arthur. Now, admittedly, we don't know when that was carved. <laughs> uh, or, uh, it doesn't say much about Guinevere. <laughs> it doesn't say anything about Lancelot. <laughs> I don't know where Lancelot is, uh, is uh, buried. Uh, if, like, if Arthur had anything to do with it, he was probably in a completely different cemetery, but we won't, we won't go there now. Now, in recent years, Glastonbury has gone through a very interesting uh, uh, transition. It's now a pilgrimage site for Anglicans, Protestants, Roman Catholics, and what might be called New Age people, right? People who like crystals and they like uh, the, the New Age. They're all, they all seem to be welcome there. Nobody is turned away at the door. Now this, for me, is a very, very interesting example of this emerging spirituality, of the radical pluralism that seems to be acceptable, uh, even to people who are part uh, of, of major existing religious traditions. To, uh, to, as you said in your series here a couple years ago, 
l learning to listen, wasn't it? Listening to the other. Listening to other voices. Listening to other voices. Listening to other voices. That's a beautiful phrase. And uh, th this has become part of the pilgrimage process as well. Listening to other voices. Um, so I think of the trip that those of us at this conference are on, those of you who've just come in this evening, you're part of this now. Those of us who've been here for a day, be here tomorrow, and then a little bit more up at Harvard uh, the next day, we are, to some extent, pilgrims. We're on a Camino. We're moving along towards something. We're not quite sure what that objective is. It's, it's a, little, a little hazy at times, but we, we are on a, a spiritual journey, if you will, uh, with each other. And there's a variety of different kinds of people on this. So it's a metaphor for me, but as I've already said, it's also an indication, for me, one of the principal indications of the uh, <coughs> emerging new spirituality of the post-secular <coughs> post -secular city. <coughs> I knew something was in the air about the Camino Compostela, the Compostela that you went on, Father. Uh, when I read the other day that 270,000 people walked that last year, and that's only the ones who registered. There are probably another two or 300,000 who walked without registering. Now, what is happening in secular Europe, I ask you, when hundreds of thousands of people begin to go to an old Christian Catholic pilgrimage route to the tomb of, of Santiago and Compostela? <coughs> Something is going on here, which doesn't quite fit into the secular model, to the secular uh, 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 model of uh, something's going on, but that's only part of it. I knew it had reached a certain threshold, the Camino de Santiago, when Harvard University uh, advertised last year that Harvard is sponsoring a pilgrimage <laughs> on, the, on, on, the, on the Camino de Santiago. And as I listened carefully, I could hear the bodies of the Puritan founders <laughs> rolling, <laughs> rolling in their graves in the uh, <laughs> and the cemetery there at, at, in Cambridge. What has happened to our Puritan University now that we're off w walking? Uh, but this is only one. Let me just quickly list. Norway has now reinstituted a, uh, an old medieval uh, pilgrimage site at uh, Trondheim in Norway. Hundreds and thousands of people are going there. There is uh, Walshingham also in the UK that I'll come back to. And I had a student a couple years ago, oh, thank you, <coughs> who uh, went over and spent some time at Lourdes, because Lourdes, again, has become in, in very, very popular. He interviewed a lot of people. He lived there for a couple weeks. And he discovered that many of the people, most of the people he talked to at Lourdes who've come there, are not churchgoers. They're not churchgoers. And he said, well, why? What are you doing here? This is a... And they said, well, there's something about this place. There's something that speaks to me. The vibrations, they would say, are really, really terrific here. Right? What is it that's happening? <coughs> what if it's possible to get a little water? Do you have some? Yeah, I'll look at that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so can I keep this up here? All right. Uh, Lords, but Lords is like many, many others, uh, many, any other of these old pilgrimage sites. Think of, think of the million, I mean literally hundreds of thousands of, and uh, millions of people each year who go to the Holy Land. Uh, uh, go to Jerusalem, go to Galilee. Uh, I, I've made that pilgrimage, some of you have made it as well. And they tell me that uh, it's, it's a little different for Catholics and Protestants. The, 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 the Catholics always like to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the Protestants all want to go up to the Galilee <laughs> to see where the Sermon on the Mount was preached, you know, and were, all, all of this. And as one of my friends says, to walk, no, they come up here to jog where Jesus walked. <laughs> <laughs> In the steps of, of Jesus. But still, still it's, it's the holy land for everybody. It's also the holy land, by the way, for Muslims who come there, uh, uh, it, it, Jerusalem is, is a ho holy city for Muslims. This is a very ecumenical center. Um, if you, uh, it occurred to me a couple years ago that the death site in Memphis of Martin Luther King Jr. 
is becoming a pilgrimage site. Hundreds of people every day pour out of buses, visit that, uh, that motel there, visit that little room, the balcony where Dr. King was, was caught, was shot. I could, uh, I could uh, list them. Uh, a, a very sad one, of course, is all those hundreds of thousands of people now who are visiting Auschwitz. It's become a kind of pilgrimage center. People stand there very quietly, remembering that awful tragedy that uh, uh, was inflicted on the Jewish people at, at Auschwitz. Uh, and uh, I have to say that the local people in, uh, who live around there have done a wonderful job in guiding people through what many of you have visited Auschwitz, I'm sure. So they aren't just happy places. They're places to remind us of the tragic elements of human life and human history and Christian history. Remember that those uh, rather raucous pilgrims that we read about in uh, Canterbury Tales were headed for uh, the cathedral where uh, Thomas Becket was killed in Canterbury, uh, murdered for standing up for the freedom of the church against the, uh, against the king. It was a murder site that they were visiting, a, a martyr site, if you will. I'm going to come back to that in a moment because some people have said to me, well, you know, a lot of the people who go nowadays on these pilgrimages, they're sort of kind of vacationers. They're kind of just tourists. In the old days, they were really religious. They were really spiritual. <laughs> go back and read Canterbury Tales. <laughs> <laughs> this is a group of pilgrims who gathered in the inn and they told their stories and you have to keep the children out of the room when you read some of those stories. They're pretty ribald, they're pretty raucous. They were telling their own stories to each other. But what was happening is as they moved along in the route to Canterbury, they were becoming a kind of a congregation. Various different kinds of people there. You know, the, uh, who I, I, I went back and read some of the other day, and I, uh, I was again charmed by this wonderful old story of the the nun priest's tale and the merchant's tale and the knight's tale and the wife of Bath. The wife of Bath goes on to Canada because she's looking for another husband. <laughs> it's rather undisguised, deeply spiritual motivation that she sees there going to Canterbury. God bless her. Now, have I made the case that uh, we now have happening here a significant phenomenon in the post secular city? It is significant. And it configures a, a, a larger spirituality which combines elements of the past, which brings in elements of the future. I want to characterize, if I can, for a moment, the, the nature of this new, newly emergent uh, world spirituality. There are going to be seven points here. I thought you'd like that, seven. That's actually a great, great number. <coughs> uh, Think for a moment of all those people you know who say, well, I'm not religious, but I'm, I'm spiritual. I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. How many times, put your hand up if you've heard that phrase. <laughs> many times, right? What are they talking about? Well, one of the things that I did was to send out some of my students. You see, when you're, when you're a teacher, you have slave labor. <laughs> you want to find out something, you do a survey, you say, oh, look, I'll, I'll give you credit for a term paper. You go out and write about this. Not survey, let's call it serfs, maybe even better than slaves. <laughs> and they interviewed people who had, who had introduced themselves as not religious but spiritual. But spiritual. But what do they mean? Almost entirely, here's what they mean. I want to have some connection with the great mystery, with God, with the spirit. But I don't like the packaging. I don't like the superstructure through which it seems to be being delivered nowadays. I, 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 but I, I, I'm not an atheist, believe me. But I want that connection. I'm looking for that connection. Uh, but I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't buy the packaging at this point. Uh, now, I think anyone here in this room knows there are plenty of things to object to about the packaging. And, and we all have our discomfort about the packaging. Uh, these are people who've taken it another step. So here, here are the, uh, uh, the qualities of this emerging new spirituality. Number one, they are more open to the mystical, the transcendent, 
dimension of faith, uh, but they're suspicious of the institutional doctrinal element. That's number one. And that's not just true in Christianity, by the way. Uh, my young Jewish students, Muslim students, I have a lot of Muslim students in my courses nowadays, will tell you the same thing. Uh, uh, it, it's across the board. Number two, they are much more oriented toward experience. They want to feel, taste, touch, not have someone else tell them about it, but to experience it themselves. That's the second one. Third, they want to continue questioning. So they're not really suitable candidates for the kind of catechism that many of us knew. Here's the question, and here's the answer. <laughs> question, answer, question, answer. No, they want to continue questioning. As one of my students told me a few years ago, you have, he said, to, order, to understand us, you have to really buy books occasionally on Amazon and know what being in search mode means. You press a little button if you say, put it in the basket, right? We're not ready to put it in the basket. <laughs> We're still in search mode. Uh, now, I, I personally don't think there's anything wrong with being in search mode. In fact, everything right. Even when you are relatively comfortable or quite comfortable with the tradition that you're a part of, you're still searching, you're still looking, still open to new interpretations, new, impossibil new possibilities. Um, uh, fourth, the new spirituality involves being rather suspicious of the high walls which have been erected between the various religious traditions, especially when those high walls involve an element of exclusivism. This is the way. This is the way. I'll tell you, we're not going to get very far with the, the next generation making that claim. This is our way. This can be your way. But there are other ways. Let's, let's listen to these different voices and see what happens. There's a deep and abiding impatience and suspicion with this kind of, uh, uh, of exclusivism, with the high walls. Uh, and when I think about future historians of religion looking back at our time, back at the 20th century, and picking out the really significant, formative religious personalities of our, of our era, one that's 20th century into the 21st, they're going to think about Martin Luther King, who was deeply influenced by Gandhi, a Hindu. Gandhi himself, deeply influenced by Tolstoy, an Orthodox Christian. They're going to think about uh, Thomas Merton, uh, who, as you may recall, a Roman Catholic uh, monk, a, a um, a Benedictine of uh, a rather, what, what was that? He, he was a Trappist, yeah, he's a Trappist, who died when he was over in Cambodia to pray with Buddhist monks. I think these are the significant breakthrough figures who are kind of illustrative of this movement. Uh, if you look at, if you ask in bookstores, college bookstores, the most, the most popular poetry book on the poetry shelf uh, is the poetry of Rumi, the Muslim Sufi mystic. Go figure, as they say. This is something new that's <laughs> happening, folks. This is, a, this is a, uh, a, a, an understanding of spirituality which has left behind that kind of ex exclusivity, that tower mentality with a moat around it, and is, is open. As, as John Paul, uh, as John the 20, 23rd said, let's open the windows. And the doors. Uh, you're, you're right, uh, uh, Father. Father I, I really do have high hopes for, for, for Francis, Pope Francis. God bless him. He has done all the right things so far. And he did a very daring thing to take the name Francis, the first pope ever to do that. That's writing a very large check, which will, he'll be expected now to at least cash in part. Uh, he is writing his own agenda, in a way, by by using the name Francis. A very, very risky thing to do. Uh, but I deeply admire him for doing that. It was a bold, bold gesture. Not just a gesture, I hope. OK, uh, well, I'm down to number six now. A, a spirituality which is, 
Oh, am I down to just five? <laughs> I'm glad somebody's counting. They're counting. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so there are only going to be six points. <laughs> well, we sort of uh, shortened the list of sacraments this evening. <laughs> Number five, okay. A spirituality which is open and welcoming to the vastly expanded universe and the vastly expanded sense of time that has come to us through science. Our grandfathers and grandmothers did not have a clue about this. The world, for they saw the stars up there, you know, and they, they, they knew a little about the, their great-grandfathers and great-grand... Uh, we, we have now this enormously expanded sense of a universe. Now they tell us maybe this is only one universe. There are a whole bunch of other universes. I'm just ready to try to understand this one before you introduce other universes or how far back it goes. Uh, uh, it, and uh, I was telling one of my colleagues coming down here in the car, I think one of the icons of this new and emerging spirituality, one of the most significant pictorial images is of that tiny little blue planet taken, I think, from the moon or from a space probe. There it is, our little home against this vast, endless darkness. And I, I, it evoked in me a sense of love for that little planet, uh, sympathy, uh, and recognition of its fragility. They didn't have that. Our grandparents didn't have that. And that has to be part of, of, of uh, this emerging spirituality, and it is. I think one of the best things I can report this evening is a, is a conversation which has emerged in the last 10 or 15 years between theologians and scientists, where that whole idea of a warfare between the two seems to have been left behind. Now we're, we are listening to each other. We are uh, uh, learning from each other <coughs> and trying to help each other take the next step. <laughs> Finally, and I think very, very important in this new spirituality is a deepened sense of the responsibility of people of faith for the poor, the brokenhearted, the marginated people of the world. I think Francis has a grasp of that, uh, as did the original Francis, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, I'm, I, that uh, we really exist in a way as people of faith to be responsible for those who have been left out, who've been cut out of the deal, and who are suffering from it. So, now I'm not making this up. <laughs> I think we are witnessing now the emergence of a very interesting and exciting new phase in the spiritual <coughs> development of, of human beings. And I want to say something now for a moment about what this might mean for, the, for future cities. Uh, let me see, I covered up my watch, so I see if I can find it under here somewhere. How am I doing? Are they are? Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, a little bit more about pilgrimage as such. Think about a pilgrimage that you've been on, that you've heard about. It is a ritual in motion. There's an element of mobility. You're moving when you're, when you're uh, on a pilgrimage. You're going from here to there. And this means that something is, something is, the inner and the outer are being fused. The change that's going on inside you and the change in location as you move along, somehow uh, support each other. I'm told that, uh, for example, on, on the, uh, on the uh, Camino de Santiago, people often walk it to try to leave behind some horrible thing that's happened to them. They've had a death of a loved one, they've lost a, a parent or a, 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 a broken marriage, lost a job, and they often bring along with them something that they can leave behind. And at a certain point on the Camino, there's this iron cross the, uh, where you can go up to that cross and put there and leave there something that you brought along to say, I'm, I'm moving on. I'm moving on. Now remember, in the old days, people used to go on pilgrimages for penance. 
But if, as, I, as I could understand the sacrament of penance, part of it, at least a, a very deep intent of penance, is to leave behind something and move on, not to, not to kind of walter in your, in your uh, wrongdoing, but to confess it, to get it off your chest, uh, to, to receive, to be reminded of forgiveness, move on, move on. It's, it's, a, it's a sacrament of, uh, of movement, which the, uh, which the uh, pilgrimages are. They're flexible. They serve the needs of different people. I don't know about your group, but uh, I've been on a couple of pilgrimage groups in which there were a wide variety of people. Some of them were believers, some of them were non-believers, some of them were believers getting, having some doubts about their belief, some of them were non-believers having doubts about their non-belief, <laughs> some of them were skeptics of their skepticism, and, and, we, and there were men and women, old and young, we're all walking along there together. We're a congregation. We're an open car, and we, we, uh, we'd stop and eat together, we'd, we'd sleep in one of these hostels together, we, and we'd tell our stories. None of them was quite as ribald as the stories in Canterbury Tales, and it's none that I heard. <laughs> but nonetheless, people talked to each other, and a new, uh, a new a community emerged, uh, a, a new kind of community that might not always emerge in a church congregation. Uh, also remember that in a pilgrimage, you leave the, you leave the noise and confusion and demand of your normal life for a little while. The pace, the expectation, the information overload, and you usually it's out in the country, you walk along, and you have an opportunity to let things settle, to pray if you pray, to meditate, to think, to drink in nature frequently. And, uh, and receive that kind of spiritual refreshment, uh, leaving it behind, all that, all that. Not to escape it, but to go somewhere for a renewal so that you can back, go back into that. We're across the crowded ways of life, as the old hymn goes, back into it with this kind of renewed spirit. No wonder so many people are going. No wonder so many people are going to, to uh, just even briefly to places like this, uh, to re renew their spirits, to take part in the liturgy if they want to, or simply to pray and meditate and walk around. Uh, uh, it, it at least makes a small contribution to the sanity uh, of the world. God knows we need more contributions for that. But I think it's this slowing down and moving slowly. I, one of the most marvelous memories I have is when I visited the old pilgrimage site at Delphi in Greece, where the Oracle of Apollo uh, used to be. And I, I, was, I was in a group, and along with the group was a, a, a distinguished colleague of mine named Eric Erickson, one of the, one of the great and famous uh, psychologists. A wonderful, wonderful man, a wonderful colleague. He was quite elderly even then. And the bus stopped as we were going way, way up the hill toward the, toward the Oracle of Delphi at the Castalian Spring, where you're supposed to cleanse yourself as you approach the Temple of Apollo. <coughs> so we got off and did a little bit of uh, cleansing. And I started to get back on the bus, and, and Eric Erickson said to me, no, 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 don't get on the bus. We're going to walk this last mile. And here's this guy who's in his 80s and just straight up like that. I said, why do we do that? He said, that's part of it. That's, that's an essential part of it. Is it you, you slow down. You approach it slowly so that when you get there, you're ready for something to happen. Very, very wise words from a very wise man. All right, I'm moving on here. And I want to talk here for a moment about the uh, 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 possible, let me just touch on the possible dangers, just to get that out of the way, a couple minutes. Some of these pilgrimages <coughs> are to places which can have both a positive and a negative connotation. Example, Our Lady of Czestochowa in Poland. I've visited there. I've been, I've been to a lot of pilgrimage sites. It's, it's, our Lady of Chestakova is the, is the figure who really inspired the resistance to the communist regime in Poland. 
the Solidarity Movement led by Lech Walesa, who still wears a little medallion of Our Lady of Chestakova on his, on his chest. I met him a few years ago when I was over there to visit Chestakova. However, as soon as that nasty business was done and Poland was liberated from the communists, within a few years, the most right-wing elements in Polish society kidnapped Our Lady of Chestakova, as it were, and made her a symbol of the kind of really quite uh, impossibly right-wing clericalist platform that they wanted to enforce on Poland. Uh, now that can happen, that can happen. Now they, it can go either way. Uh, and I'm thinking also of the, uh, uh, the uh, Yasukuni Shrine in, in Tokyo, which uh, recently the Prime Minister of, of Japan has been visiting when he's not supposed to do that sort of thing as a kind of an indication that he wants to reclaim Shinto as a national religion. That's the religion that helped empower Japanese militarism. So watch out for that. Uh, of course, it can also be corrupted by business. There's lots of money involved. So some of the people who were really pleased with the uh, emergence of, uh, of uh, this new pilgrimage uh, interest are all the hostels and hotels along the way, and of course, all the people who sell souvenirs, <laughs> wherever they are, trinkets uh, uh, along the way, when you get there. Uh, I came back from, from uh, Fatima a few years ago with a little uh, Madonna who uh, lights up <laughs> when you press a little button. And my wife said to me, she said, now look, uh, I know you like this kind of religious kitsch. <laughs> and I put up with a lot of it. But look, a, a, a Madonna that you can turn on and light up? Don't you think that's a little beyond the limit? So I, I have her se secreted away somewhere. There. <laughs> A lot of money to be made. <coughs> um, okay, finally, implications. Implications. I think there are enormous implications of this newly emerging spirituality for the way we think about, plan, and build our future cities. For this reason, uh, cities should nurture and support rather than discourage or deny human spirituality. And that, you have to do that from the outset. You have to do that from the way you plan the cities and not just add things on after they're already, after they're already built. So what would that include? Well, uh, think about these mixed congregations that I was just talking about. You don't know who's going to be in your pilgrimage group. You, there could be all kinds of people that join it. Uh, will the future city that our children and grandchildren will live in, the world city, be a place of gated communities, ghettos, built-in separation between races and classes and people, or will it be a city that welcomes the interchange and meeting of people of, from various backgrounds and, and various uh, perspectives? That can be built into the city. And what we're building into them now is not that. What we're building into them now a lot is precisely the gated community concept. I go behind my gate, I close it, and I want you to come in. OK, something else. Um, what about the uh, uh, nature? That's, that's become a very important point for many people. There, when you talk to people who've been on pilgrimages, they just say, oh, I really love being out in the countryside there along the Camino and other places and seeing uh, the trees and birds and hearing those things. They, uh, they also liked those little Romanesque churches. I'm talking about the Camino here, the, along the way. The architecture, the music, the art of these. Now, these are people who don't normally go into churches. It says to me that there's something about the architectural expression, I'm speaking here as a Christian for the moment, of our faith, which can convey a deep meaning, even with people who get turned off by sermons. It says something at, a, at, a, at an aesthetic, at a deep spiritual level. Will that be part of the future city, or will that be banned or not thought about? Open-ended. Can people come and go? What about parks, as far as this nature business is concerned? <clears throat> 
Isn't it interesting that we, we pick up the paper today, there's a, 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 a virtually a revolution starting in Istanbul that started when they tried to close a park and build a, uh, a, 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 a shopping mall. <clears throat> Think about that. Don't take our park away and build a, build a shopping mall. You're not going to do that. I don't think they will either uh, at, at, at the moment. So think about all these, uh, <clears throat> all these, these possibilities. Uh, we're talking here this afternoon. We had some wonderful presentations about historical preservation, about what you have to maintain in a city so that people can have a sense of history, of their history, of the history of their city, of where their, his, his, where their people came from, so that they can have a sense of the future. And I think that's part of it uh, there as well. Now, I want to end with just a couple remarks. Do I still have a couple minutes? <laughs> <laughs> About its uh, particular implications for, for religion. And, and <clears throat> I think the ecumenical and interfaith aspect of the new pilgrimages is very, very important. Uh, you all come. There are a lot of people, religious, not religious, different religious traditions who are participating in these, uh, uh, in these uh, pilgrimages. And everybody's welcome. <coughs> Nobody's excluded because they don't uh, wear, wear the right badge. As long as you're willing to go along on the trip, as long as you're willing to be open to the experience, as long as you're willing to share your story with the others who are with you and listen to their stories. Let me repeat that. Share your story and listen to the other stories. That's really about the only entrance requirement. Uh, and I think that's going to make a big difference and is making a difference <coughs> in uh, religion, and, and uh, both the ecumenical and the interreligious phase. OK, I'm about finished here. <coughs> you can see me flipping over the pages. <laughs> um, pilgrimage responds to the needs of the spiritual but not religious crowd, as well as to those who are more settled in a religious tradition. It is prayer in motion. It is a, an expression of the fusing of the inner and the outer, uh, outer movement. Uh, and it's also a, uh, a particularly, a particularly uh, effective way of reminding oneself that we are all on the way. We have not arrived. We haven't arrived. Uh, we're on the way, uh, homo viator, as, as somebody has called us, and this whole idea of the mixed congregation. So um, that's the summary. Relig uh, pilgrimage, open, unbounded formation. Easy to drop in, easy to drop out. I think that says something about church architecture, by the way. What, uh, somebody said we should well, widen the threshold and raise the ceiling higher. Don't make that step from the outside in such a terribly difficult, demanding one. Make that a little more porous. Uh, as some of us have said here, maybe the storefront church tells us a little about that. But the storefront church, see, you can walk along and see what's going on, and then, <laughs> and then uh, possibly come in, possibly not. Whereas for many, many churches, it seems to be almost a, 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 a portcullis that snaps down uh, to keep you from just coming in and looking around. <coughs> uh, change in, in architecture is called on. Um, unites inner and outer. Uh, a chance to break away from the chain of routine, to be refreshed, bring nature back into the picture, and leave behind the things that you want to leave behind, move on to whatever the future holds. So there are my conclusions, folks. <clears throat> and we need to build cities in the next 25 years that will reflect, support, uh, this kind of spirituality and not quench it. Because the people who live in those cities, who will live in those cities, as human beings, have a right to have their spirituality respected, sustained, and not 
uh, and not uh, erased. They deserve it. They should have it. There are a lot of implications in here for, per for public health. Spirituality is now uh, recognized by the World Health Organization as one essential component of health. It wasn't up until a few years ago. Everyone is welcome. So this is really my conclusion. <coughs> <laughs> You're all fellow pilgrims now with us. We're all on the way, on the Camino, from the monastery to the city, if you will. We're on the Camino. And we really shouldn't be turning back. There is no turning back. Now, if we can't quite discern with any real clarity what that future world city will look like, I suggest we take some comfort in the words with which John Bunyan starts his book, Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim is about to start out on, the, on his pilgrimage, but he doesn't know which way to go. So the spirit comes to him. I remember reading this as a, as a young kid. The spirit says to him, dost see yon city? And he says, no, I, I don't, no. Dost see yon wicker gate? No. Dost see yon glimmering light? He says, yeah. Follow it then. Follow it then. You don't quite see the city, we not even see the gate. But a little light is on, <clears throat> and I hope we can follow it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to comment or questions? Sure, sure. A few. Thank you very much, Professor Cox. He's willing to uh, entertain comments or questions. Um, if you do have a comment, would you stand up and try to project your voice? And if you're not able, I'll come back and give you the microphone. Anybody want to volunteer this at the beginning? It seems a appreciation of the cloth. Uh, and I'm right here. Oh, you're right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I muted. Um, I appreciate your, your, your thoughts and your everything and your years of effort in this, in this way. Um, it seems one of the challenges of the city and the cities of millions that we have today is community. How do you respect? There's always a tension between the desire for community, which leads us either inward or to more orthodoxy, if you will, or more closeness with people that Affinity in the midst of the work. One of the major challenges is to define within or open up ways in which people can find the community that they have been accustomed to in family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in villages, uh, and in churches. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Um, did you hear? You heard the, the. It wasn't really a question. It was a statement, but it was a good statement. And I think it's important to remind ourselves that the earliest Christian congregations were urban congregations. They were in places like Ephesus, Corinth, Rome. These were not rural areas. These were, and they were populated by people who came from different places, came from different classes. In fact. Early Christians became famous for the fact that there was neither Jew nor Greek, neither Jew nor, nor Gentile, barbarian or free. They were all drawn together in this new community. So it was a new community. It was a kind of a model community, if you will, which uh, broke away from the traditional definitions of community as being entirely defined by family or entirely defined by nation or by class or even by religion. Uh, it was uh, the emergence of a new kind of community. 
So I guess what I'm suggesting here is we do need models, uh, even on a very small scale, of the kind of community you're talking about. I couldn't agree more. This is really, people are enormously hungry and interested in that. Uh, and, but we are kept apart uh, so often by custom and, I'm afraid, by the way our cities are laid out. And, and 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 built for us that we inhabit. We we just don't encounter these uh, these other people. So <clears throat> both the models of community that we, we need, religious community, if you will, and in in the larger sphere, uh, cities that do not at least choke off the possibility of community, but even facilitate it, help it to happen. <clears throat> you. Uh spoke about the fact that the new spiritualism is open to the expanded universe that is revealed through science. And I was thinking of a statement made by Richard Feynman, who said that in terms of method methodology, religion and science are very different, that the essence of religion is faith and the essence of science is doubt. So do you think that division has begun to dissolve, that faith is beginning to intrude into science and doubt into religion? <laughs> I think the, uh, the so-called warfare between ch uh, science and religion, which somebody said was going on in the 19th century and so on, just seems to me so outmoded now, so completely yesterday. Uh, when I talk to my colleagues who are scientists, serious scientists, many of them are deeply concerned and, and committed to these spiritual questions that I've been raising here and see religion as an ally. And I think the, the churches have changed a good deal. You know, when they, was it Pius XII who made this statement that, of course, we can accept evolution, uh, the evolution, physical evolution of human beings. That's not, and as far as this huge, huge, big, big universe is concerned, <coughs> it's, it's, uh, it's quantitatively a lot bigger, but uh, it looked awfully big to the, <laughs> to the people who wrote the Psalms. <laughs> when I survey the works of thy hands, the heavens, and all that, it looked pretty big then, too. So qualitatively, the qu question is not, is not that much bigger. Now, as far as method is concerned, I don't think I agree that, uh, that uh, uh, science is about doubt and religion is about belief. Uh, religion, both of them are about search. I'll go back to that word. Both of them are about looking for something they're looking for something a little different. Now let me, let, me, uh, uh, let me recommend a book. And this is a book by my colleague, late colleague, Stephen Jay Gould, who used to write uh, one of the most uh, uh, widely read American scientists. He's a, par a paleontologist, a, a splendid colleague, a wonderful guy. He died just a few years ago. We actually taught a course together for a couple of years at Harvard. He wrote a book with a wonderful title. It's called Rocks of Ages. <laughs> rocks of Ages. One of the rocks is science, and one of the rocks is religion. And his thesis in that book was, we need each other. Science measures, science investigates, uh, 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 but science as science has no capacity to ask about value or meaning. Not as science. When a scientist does that, He's not doing it qua scientist. He's doing it qua human being. And we have a whole tradition of philosophy, theology, religious studies in which those kinds of questions have been thought about and refined over very many years. Now, Steve Gould went on to say, when religion intrudes into science and begins telling us the age of the earth, for example, we've, 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 gone, we, we've violated the boundary. That's not our business to talk about that. And, but when science says, ah, oh, well, you know, as, the, as some of the Russian scientists have said uh, a few decades ago, when Gagarin was up flying around in a rocket, he said, he went very, very high up and he didn't see any angels. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, they were actually uh, uh, putting out that line, that somehow another science was going to displace uh, religion in that sphere. I think not. And I'm, I'm very encouraged about the new and productive conversation that's emerging now between and among scientists and theologians. I think it's a whole new chapter 
which will certainly play into this new spirituality that I've been describing. I have a question, sir. Um, you spoke of the new um, spiritual but not religious being open to mystical and transcendent aspects of faith. Is there any expectation or demand for transformation? Um, or is there this apt to become a kind of elevated uh, consumerism? Yeah, that's, uh, there is a danger. There is a danger and that I am concerned about uh, <coughs> of uh, wanting to have all the goodies and not expose yourself to the painful aspects of the discipline, the transformation that a mature religious tradition can bring and should bring. Uh, however, remember the folks that go on these pilgrimages are, whether they use the word or not, are fr frequently looking for some kind of an inner transformation, which could translate into a wider social transformation as well, if it's the, it's the right kind of thing. Uh, but I think it has to be guided, or it can be very, can be very uh, navel-gazing, if you will, uh, the, the quest for spirituality. And this is why I, I, I'm watching for the emergence of new institutional forms that the church might help to create churches might help to create, which can provide the venues for the self-critical thinking of people involved in the new spirituality, which many of our, our par parishes now are really not so well equipped to do. But if we had those venues, I think it would be a great, great contribution. <clears throat> okay, about one more question. I think my voice is fading a bit here. Yes? Amen. very much for coming to speak with us. Uh, we hear a great deal today about mindfulness yeah. uh, emerging very much from the Buddhist tradition. And here at the monastery, we're very aware of the Thomas Merton centering prayer. And uh, also here, we're also aware of the work of Herbert Benson and relaxation mm -hmm. response. Uh, in terms of the hallmarks of this emerging spirituality, how do you view that, that sensibility, that understanding? Mm -hmm. I should mention that <clears throat> Herbert Benson has been part of our group at, uh, at Harvard, which, where we're trying to bring together now School of Public Health, Medical School, Divinity School, School of Design. I think for the first time in the history of Harvard. <laughs> I, I can't find any other time over the history of Harvard when people from these different schools have come together systematically to talk about issues that we know we have to confront together. We can't do it in our own little silos. And Herb Benson has been a part of that, and I think a very important part, because he has empirically demonstrated the absolute necessity of this moment when you break away from the routine and the noise and you focus, use a mantra, use a prayer, uh, but he understands also the, the, the that worship does that, pilgrimage does that, uh, so that you can recollect yourself, as it were, and, and venture back into the into that noisy, demanding world. He's, he's very good at that. And he doesn't just speculate about it. I mean, he's, he's, he's a, he's a hard-nosed scientist, uh, in, in a way. He, he measures it with graphs and things on your arm and so on. Uh, he, he, wants, he, he doesn't just make it up. So he's a very good ally in what we're doing here, and I, I, I appreciate that, that part of it. Um, and as far as Buddhism is concerned, I think it's, it's one of the voices that we're listening to uh, and uh, uh, should be listening to. And they have insights that they've maintained over centuries and centuries that we can certainly incorporate, I speak as a Christian, into Christianity without in any way diluting or distorting who we are as Christians. Thank you. I want, I want to personally thank you for uh, kind of um, giving uh, credence to pilgrimage. <laughs> I just, just returned to come Italy for the group for two weeks. And one of the telling remarks at the final meeting one night was one lady said, I've been coming here to the Abbey for 30 years 
and not gotten to know people as I've gotten to know in these two weeks. Because they told each other stories. Mm -hmm. and that, that is a very important part. It's not just touring or seeing sights. You know? So you elucidating that helped me. And I thank you very kindly. Thank you, thank you for everything you've brought with us tonight. Thank you.